Uh, welcome to Deschutes Public Library's virtual programming. Uh, we're really pleased to have everybody here today um, because May is National Historic Preservation Month when we celebrate our shared history through historic places. This program about the Redmond Caves is presented in partnership with the Redmond Historical Landmarks Commission Saving Places event series of which the library is super pleased to be a part of. <clears throat> Our speaker, Patrick O'Grady, is a state staff archeologist at the University of Oregon Museum of Natural and Cultural History. He earned his BS, MS, and PhD from the University of Oregon. He has been involved in the University of Oregon field schools since 1994 and as an instructor since 2000. For a complete bio of uh, Patrick O'Grady, please check out our website. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Patrick O'Grady. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am an archeologist for the University of Oregon. I work basically for the Museum of Natural and Cultural History. And as part of my duties, I get to teach archeological field schools. I've been doing that for a while and it's just one of my favorite things. Uh, to do of all time. So what I want to do is talk to you about Redmond Caves and the work that we did there in, in 2005 and 2006 with an archaeological field school made up of students not only from the University of Oregon, but from places all over the U.S. and sometimes from countries outside of it. So archaeology is not an individual thing. It's it's done best through collaborations. And this project at Redmond Caves was a really great one because it involved the Prineville District Bureau of Land Management uh, and the city of Redmond. They, both of those groups wanted to set aside 40 acres of land that was being horribly abused. So um, the property on which Redmond Caves exists has a lot of junipers on it, it has a lot of roads going into it, and people are driving in there and dumping stuff and then uh, taking off, and it turned into an informal dump site. And so what Bureau of Land Management and City of Redmond wanted to do was uh, turn it into a natural park, clear all the stuff off of it and turn it into a park. And so that's when they got involved with the U of O about doing archeological work out there. Uh, aside from those two, the Oregon State Park Systems got involved. Uh, Smith Rock State Park led us camp on uh, site there at Smith Rock for the three weeks that we were working at Redmond Caves, uh, both years. And uh, it was really a great place to come to at the end of the day. And then uh, the other partner was the University of Oregon Department of Anthropology and the museum that I work for. So this is an old map. Uh, this shows Redmond, uh, the community of Redmond as it was a few years back. And then that parcel of land where the caves are located is down to the south. And uh, it's now currently, uh, adjacent to Airport Road, and you can see the big sign uh, for the BLM uh, Redmond Caves when you drive by on your way to the airport. So here's what the property looks like. So this is 40 acres, and what you'll see here is uh, that there are roads that create a hub around the main cave, the one that everybody goes to, which is called Cave One. So here it is in the center. And then cave two is over here. Cave three is a little further to the south. And then four and five, you can actually see from Airport Road. They're a substantial, one, cave four is a substantial uh, cave and cave five is not much in terms of a uh, place to do archeology. span uh, And then these other parcels that you see, these little polygons, are uh, the locations of sites that were recorded on the surface uh, while we were out there doing work uh, on the parcel. So not only do we want to know about the caves, but we also wanted to know about the surface sites that were there as well. So what makes Redmond Caves interesting to archeologists is the fact that it's located in a junction for a number of physiographic provinces. So the Columbia Basin is up here to the north, Blue Mountains, High Lava Plains, uh, Basin and Ranges down here, and then you have the High Cascades right here. 
And people who occupied all of those physiographic settings had different suites of resources uh, available to them. And they would uh, come in through the Redmond Caves area, through Bend, just past Newberry Crater, on their way up towards the Columbia to trade for salmon and other goods uh, at various times. So what we want to know is who are the people who are passing through, uh, going, as to, going north or south and in the other directions and stopping at Redmond Caves? And can we detect that archaeologically? So that's why I put this physiographic province picture in here is to give you a sense of how much uh, uh, geologic and geographic diversity is associated with the Redmond Caves and the fact that it is in the high lava plains itself. So when we started working at Redmond Caves, not only were we doing archaeological research, but we were also talking to people who were interested in what we were doing. Um, people were stopping by all the time. They see the state rigs parked out uh, in front of the uh, uh, in front of the parcel on Airport Road. And they want to know what the estate guys are doing there. So they would come walking in and, and check us out. And one of them was a fellow named Glenn Hutchinson. And he started going to Redmond Caves as a young man in 19, in 1929, he said. And so he was asking me about what we were finding. And, and I said, well, you were looking here for artifacts too. So tell me, tell me, how did you look for artifacts when you came to Redmond Caves back in those early days? And he, what he said was, we looked for charcoal stains on the surface. That's where the fire pits were. And there were usually points around them. And so what Glenn was telling us was that in 1929, when he first started going there, the surface of the, the floor in the caves was basically intact. And they'd look for where the fires had been uh, from people who were passing through their native people. And then that's where they would start exploring and searching for stone tools and other things. So along with Hutchinson, uh, we also got to talk to a, a couple of guys that as young boys went to Redmond Caves too. This is Bruce Rogers. And when he was young, he and a fellow named Dick Noe and another boy named Jim Dale started digging at the caves uh, as boys. And so, um, <coughs> excuse me. So Bruce was an important person to talk to because he had knowledge about what was happening at the caves as did Dick. And here's Dick Noy and his son, David. So in 2006, when we were there at the caves, Dick came to visit because he remembered them as a boy. And his son, David, brought him to the caves. Dick was in town for his 55th uh, high school reunion, I believe it was. And he, as a young man, went to Korea and fought in the Korean conflict and was blinded by a hand grenade. So um, he couldn't see his way to the cave, so his son brought him. And when Dick came and spent time with us, he explained what they were finding in the caves. And then he stood in the middle of the cave entrances and would wave his hands around and say, well, over here we found this and over here we found this. It's just really interesting, uh, uh, really great guy to talk to. And when he started talking to us about his collection, it soon turned out that he also had a collection of cultural objects that came from the caves that were amassed by him and the other two boys. And so these are some of the stone tools in the collection amassed by Dick Noe and Bruce Rogers. So the things that are interesting here to me as an archeologist is the fact that there are Columbia River style points, plateau style points like this one, and there are Great Basin style points like this one that are found both to the north and to the south. And you could go through and talk about each of these if I had time. But the fact is that in this one case right here, we can see uh, stone tools that reflect Columbia River occupations as well as uh, Plateau and Great Basin people as well. 
So this was a piece of basketry that Dick and Bruce and Jim had gotten from the cave. This looks like it's part of a burden basket, perhaps, a loosely woven burden basket. And this piece here looks like sagebrush matting. In addition, there's some basketry uh, and twining and things like that that are visible in this image. Also, here's more cordage. Here's uh, some more pieces of basketry, and these are bone tools that they collected uh, as well. Here's some bone tubes over here, a variety of different things, animal teeth that were formed in dependence, dentalium shell, marine shell beads, lots of stuff was showing up from their collections. And it was really valuable for us to see these because of the fact that we wouldn't see anything like this in our work at the um, caves itself. And then I'll point out here, this is a bone fish hook. And so this is a unique artifact to see at the site. And then this is a little piece of a, a bone that was shaped into a, what we call a zoomorphic image. So it's got an eye uh, and a mouth here. And it has another utilitarian use that I believe it was an atlatl spur for a atlatl, a dart throwing system. So we benefited a lot from the work or from the explorations that other people did at um, Redmond Caves. So we have people like Glenn Hutchinson, Dick Noe, uh, Bruce Rogers, Jim Dale are coming through the caves. They're collecting things out of the caves and those are important for us to see as archeologists. Uh, and so I always wanna talk about the relationship that our archeologists have with collectors. There are things that we can learn uh, from them that are, I think are very important. Hey, Pat. Yeah. Just a quick question is that uh, in the Q&A. So when you were looking at those artifacts and you're, are you moving your cursor around? Because people are not seeing you move your cursor around when you're- Oh, I was. Them. Yes, I was. Hmm. Okay. I don't know why that's not showing up. Well, but now I, I know that, now I know that's a little of use, so I won't try to. Yeah. So if you want to give them some like visual indicators, like this thing okay. on the right or, or some such. So. All right, I will okay. do that. Thank Sorry you. about that. Yeah. Nope, you're good. So that was just a little detour into what kinds of things were coming out of those caves and, and local history, which I always think is very important. But now let's talk about the UFO involvement and how we got started working at the caves themselves. So in the 1940s, uh, Dick Noe's dad, who I'll refer to as Mr. Noe, uh, knew Joe Brown, who was then the editor of the Redmond Spokesman and introduced him to the caves. And so uh, Joe Brown realized what a treasure the caves were potentially for archeologists. And he contacted Luther Cressman at the University of Oregon. So Luther was on sabbatical. He was uh, doing Guggenheim Fellowship work back east. And so he had a person who ended up being a professor at Berkeley named Robert Heiser filling in for him while he was gone. And Luther sent Robert Heiser out to investigate the site. Uh, this was in 1941. Uh, Heiser digs some test pits and just wasn't really finding what he wanted to find out of the, these, these caves. And so uh, he just didn't get very excited about it. He didn't pass on any level of excitement to Luther Cressman. And so they kind of abandoned work at Redmond Caves for other things. And it was 60 years later in about 2000, and two, that Marge Helzer, who was teaching at Central Oregon Community College, started working at the caves. Uh, she is an archeologist with the University of Oregon and doing part-time teaching at Central Oregon College. So here's Luther. This is what he looks like in a picture taken at Fort Rock Cave. And then here's Robert Heiser. And he was the person that filled in for Luther Cressman. So, um, 
there was not much of a report written on the work in the 1940 Redmond Caves uh, excavations. <clears throat> and so um, I went into the university archives looking for information about the caves because I knew Heiser had been out there working. And I found this passage from uh, Carl Huffaker, who also worked with Heiser out there. Heiser and I went over to Redmond last week to check out the caves that Brown reported. It didn't produce anything of value. There were plenty of specimens in the deposit, but there was no evidence of either cultural or geologic stratification. We dug three test pits in various parts of the caves, which produced only points, scrapers, and spalls. In looking over the surface, we found a nice sagebrush bark sandal. Nowhere in the deposit did we find the usual straw or food bones to indicate a camp of any duration. The whole thing was so full of ash and dust that it was necessary to shovel it out and sift it, which produced only a point to about every two or three screenfuls. We decided the site would make interesting pot hunting, but would not warrant further work. We spent a night posing as cavemen, but it was two and a half miles to water, so it was easy to see why it was not occupied for any longer than an occasional overnight stop. So that constituted the entire report on the work at Redmond Caves by Robert Heiser and Carl Huffaker, November 4th, 1940. Uh, but not to be outdone, Heiser decided to add his own piece to this too. And here's Heiser's report. Carl and I made the trip to Redmond. It netted enough specimens to give what is probably a representational sampling, but the caves do not look particularly promising from the standpoint of doing a job in them. Carl says he will give you the dope on the trip in caves, so I will let it go. And so this was all I had to work with from the archives. I spent a lot of time there too. So I was a little frustrated because the main reason I went there is that we had these artifacts that were still curated at the University of Oregon from the work out at uh, Redmond Caves. And projectile points are on the left, some stone uh, tools, cutting tools are on the right, and a few specialized little drills and engravers are down at the bottom. In the middle up uh, at the top there is a grinding stone for cracking a great base and wild rye and other hard seeds. So pretty interesting to know that those things were coming out of the caves. But the main thing we were interested in is that sagebrush sample that uh, had been recovered. And so I was looking for information about where that was, and we still don't know which cave it was in. So we did get a radiocarbon date of 1,820 plus or minus 40 BP. And this allows me to talk just very briefly about how archaeologists work. And so every piece of information that we save out of an archaeological site provides insight that helps us in the future when we work at other places or try and establish regional context for the types of artifacts that are found. So this sandal is similar to the one in the center, which is called a multiple warp sandal type. There's three types of Great Basin sagebrush bark sandals. And that one from Redmond Caves is like the one in the center. And by finding that, or by having saved that from the caves, what it does is it allows us to expand the known uh, occupation or the known uh, distribution of multiple warp sandals like that about 40 or 50 miles beyond where they were known previously. So it just tells us more about how things were carried, how things were used, and every piece fits into a larger jigsaw puzzle of other pieces that helps us reconstruct the past. So um, saving things like that is really important, but it sure would have been nice to know where they came from out of those caves too. Oh well. So Heiser and Cressman were interested in bigger projects. This is uh, uh, from the Dallas Road Cut site. And what you can see is standing up there in that shadowed area, there's a straight line, a stadia rod, and a person holding that. And you can see how deep that cut is. Uh, and there's another person down further, and that's Luther Cressman working on deep stratified sites uh, in places like the Columbia River, uh, areas where there are big sites that he was more interested in. Redmond Caves just didn't fit into the things he wanted to be looking at at that time. 
So let's get to when Marge Helzer takes over and starts doing work at Redmond Caves in 2002. So the first thing she did, if you can imagine taking a crew of about 20 college students and asking them to, or, to, to organize into a straight line uh, across a large expanse of ground and walk together looking for objects on the ground that tell us where archeological sites were. That was what she did. So it's called pedestrian survey. And it's the first thing that we do to identify where sites are. We look on the surface to see uh, what's present there. And so Marge and her crew did that. And in this picture, you'll see that there's a number of pin flags with red red pin flags that are located sticking out of the ground to mark the location of artifacts and flakes from chipping stone tools and things like that. So Marge took her crew and they walked in five meter increments or you know about 15 feet apart uh, over the entire 40 acre expanse, dodging junipers and uh, other things and uh, recorded all the sites that were on the surface. Once they were identified, Marge and the crew returned for what we call testing or phase two. So once we know where the sites are, we want to know how deep they are, how deep the archaeological deposits are, and where the boundaries are located. So you can see flakes of obsidian and other material on the surface, but that may not necessarily tell you how big the site is because some of that stuff might be buried. So her and her crews went out there and dug 50 by 50 centimeter test pits at intervals across the entire parcel, uh, or across the entire site, eight sites, to determine their composition. So that was good stuff. They did good work. And we learned a lot about the surface expression of archaeology at Red McKay's. And then this is a bigger excavation they dug in front of one of the cave entrances and they were taking soil samples there, which are in those plastic bags in front of them. So um, different kinds of excavation unit, units were dug for different purposes and plus then all the walking surveys. So not only were they finding prehistoric sites uh, but they're also finding historic sites. And at one point, Marge came to me and said, I don't know what this is, but it's a little bit scary. Can you tell me about this? And uh, it turned out that it was an early set of dentures uh, made out of some sort of uh, uh, canvas composition with these bakelite teeth or something like that. It's really uh, a shocking thing to see laying on the surface there. But the thing about that is that it, it, it tells us that not only were people living there in times before recorded history, but that there were old sites into the 1800s and up through the 1950s, and then a modern overlay of, of trash that had to be removed too. So, so far with Marge's work and talking to various people that had come through to see what we were doing, we had, collaborated with state and federal agencies. We did a literature search looking for information about where the sandals and the other stuff that Heiser collected came from. Communication with local informants. Uh, we did phase one surveys, phase two testing, and there were interim reports written of the activities that occurred during each season that Marge was out there. After that, there was preparation for the next round, and that was where I got to be involved. So Marge got hired to be a teacher at um, Lane Community College in Eugene, and uh, I was hired back at the museum to take over as a staff archeologist and to do field schools. And so my first work there was in 2005, and I started working inside the caves because Marge hadn't gotten there yet. So the 2005 work started with exploring each of the five caves after Mark, Marge had finished exploring the eight surface sites. And here you can see a crew working in front of cave one, the big central cave, uh, digging excavation units out in front of the cave. And we use that line right in the middle as a marker 
um, to set units at 10 meter intervals going from out front down into the back of the cave. So this is a sketch map. It's a little hard to see, I think, in this context, but what it shows you is where the those black squares are where the excavation units were located, both in front of the cave uh, and then inside the cave. And there's a kind of a wiggly line about halfway across that is the, the cave roof. So the where the rubble piles are in front and where the cave is in, uh, to the right is shows where we dug both inside and outside of the cave. Here's what it looked like inside of the cave. Once you get away from the entrance, you're into darkness and we had to have a generator that powered lights so that we could see where we we're excavating and to do our excavations in orderly intervals and uh, collect information carefully. Here's Haley. The best places to work in a cave are usually in the area in front of the cave, inside, but in the area of natural light. And Haley is digging in an area that has already been dug out quite extensively uh, by other people exploring and, and looting the caves. Uh, but she did uh, find some things in that deep excavation she's working in there. Uh, so in 2005, we were able to explore cave one uh, to some extent. And then uh, what we realized is that most of the deposits inside of cave one were uh, heavily churned up and damaged and that we weren't going to find much uh, by just going about working there in the usual pattern. So in 2006, we came back. This is Dennis Jenkins. I had him come back with me because he's dug a lot in caves and asked for some advice about how he thought I should approach this. And one of his suggestions was that we remove a great big boulder that is inside the cave. So backhoes are our friends. And in this case, we use a backhoe to move a great big boulder. You can see it here being tipped up by the bucket and flipped over backwards out of the way of an area that we thought might be protected inside the cave entrance. So once we cleared that boulder out of the way, we figured no one had dug underneath there and we had the best chance of finding uh, archeology span in that context. So here are the students in 2006 working in the area where that boulder was, digging units up in, onto the apron uh, from the floor of the cave inside. And then here's another view of them working in those units underneath that boulder. It was a big piece of rock and it protected a lot. So what this picture shows, you can see a yellow tape measure coming from the surface inside the cave down to one of our excavation levels. And to the right of that, you'll see a kind of a dark and mottled area that looks different from the lighter sand around it. That is an old fire pit. And around that fire pit, buried underneath that big rock, was a, a concentration of stone tools, um, cooked bone, burned bone, unburned bone, uh, chips of flaking debris from making tools. A lot of different stuff was there right around that fire pit, you know, where people would sit and do things to, as the fire burned to, so they could cook food and stay warm. And so we had this one little protected lens inside the cave uh, fire pit that had charcoal in it that we could get a radiocarbon date from. So not only were we working in cave one under that boulder, but we were also working in caves three and four and five during that same season. And in cave three, which you can see the interior of here, we're digging into a pile of dirt that had been thrown in a big pile that had been created by artifact collectors digging out the cave in times past. So they dug out the back corner of one portion of the cave and piled all the dirt. And we figured that nobody other than an archeologist would be crazy enough to dig through a pile of dirt to get to what's underneath it when it's already 
when the pile of dirt is already all disturbed. And so using that logic, we dug a hole in cave three. And here you can see uh, Meredith and, and Dave uh, working in their pit and measuring up to the surface to get a floor elevation for their uh, paperwork. So uh, we had to go deep, but we were pretty successful in working in that cave. Oops. So I know that I'm running short on time and I have to kind of speed things up here. But so in 2005, we had to, or in 2005, I'm sorry, we worked in cave one and cave two. And so in 2006, we worked in caves three, four, and five, as well as cave one. And so what I want to talk to you about here is what each of the caves produced in just a very general way. So you understand what the results were of the work that we were doing. So cave one is shown on the left. And then that fire pit that I showed you in a couple of slides back, uh, we did uh, get a radiocarbon date on a piece of burned willow. Um, there's no willows growing in the area of the site today, so we knew that that would be a significant piece of material to date. And we got a radiocarbon date out of that fire hearth of 3,970 BP. So that one little protected piece of cave one with a, with a buried feature uh, ended up being 4,000 years old. And that's the only successful radiocarbon date we got out of that cave in all of its entirety. Down below are some of the stone tools that we found. Those stone tools indicate that there were people coming from the desert country to the south and from the plateau country to the north. And they were passing back and forth through the area around Redmond Caves. There were also marine shell beads that were found from trading. So we have uh, pieces of dentalium shell and olivella shell and a couple of other kinds, including some abalone that were uh, traded in from the coastline, uh, both Oregon and Washington, and as well as down in Southern California that made their way to the caves through various people uh, carrying them or trading them. Cool stuff to find that. Cave two, we dug there very briefly. We tried to dig very deeply, but the thing that we found about that cave is that it's still buried. So it has not been dug out and you can see just a little wedge, a, a little gap of the cave in the picture on the left-hand side. But what tells you something really interesting is that when we weren't successful getting very deep in our digging, we switched to a T-handle geologic auger and we put four sections on it to get four and a half meters below the surface. And we never touched the rocky um, bottom of the cave entrance. So we know that that one's buried. And I really love the fact that it is buried and hasn't been dug into because that tells us that there's a cave with, uh, with potential archeological material in it that's protected for future generations. <clears throat> Cave three was heavily disturbed. That was the one I showed you the people taking the measurements uh, from underneath the looter's dirt. And so you can see there's a variety of stone tools. These also reflect Great Basin, uh, Desert, and Columbia Plateau uh, types of, of arrow and uh, atlatl dart points. Um, we also had a piece of bulrush cordage that we got out of there that had a radiocarbon date of 560 years before present. A soapstone or steatite pendant came out of there. And then on the very last hours of the very last day of excavation, we found an Elkhorn digging stick handle uh, that was quite extraordinary. And we were getting ready to leave at about 4.30 and we ended up not leaving until 7.30 because we had to dig down to find out what was below that and achieve sterile levels of excavation before we could leave. So that made for a very long, but a very exciting day. So that was in cave three. Cave four was very interesting too. This is called the Lions Club Cave because it was initially dug out 
in 19 or yeah 1954 uh, by members of the uh, Central Oregon Lions Club. And there was not much archaeology in there, but that stone point, you can see opposite sides of a, a stem point up in the upper right corner that is a minimum of 8,000 years old. And then down in that lower picture, you can see chunks of, of bone. These are megafaunal uh, bones from large animals that are extinct species that were present in the deposits in that cave. So not only do we have ancient stone tools there, but we also have partially fossilized megafauna uh, remains present uh, in cave 4 too. And then we did just a little bit of work in cave 5, but it hasn't been um, there's not much to work with there and it doesn't go very far. So uh, we were unable to do much or find much in cave five, but those are the five caves that we dug at in that um, 2005 and 2006 period. This is just a quick note on the obsidian. Uh, we had some of the stone tools that were made of obsidian geochemically sourced using X-ray fluorescence. And artifacts that came from inside the caves show that people were coming from the south, from Silver Lake and Sycam Marsh for Newberry Crater. They were coming from the west, from obsidian cliffs up on the west side of uh, 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 the North Sister, uh, and they were coming from Glass Butte, which is well over uh, towards Burns, about 75 miles from, um, from Bend. So sources are coming to the, from the south and from both the east and from the west for artifacts that were found inside of the caves. For those that were found outside of the caves, we have sources from obsidian cliffs again, and then from a location down uh, in California and another one in Southern Oregon uh, near the California border. So the obsidian sourcing tells us something very interesting about mobility patterns and possibly trade patterns too. Comparing those with information about where Newberry obsidian is found in other circumstances, I show you this map that shows archaeological sites that have Newberry obsidian that's being carried from uh, Newberry Crater all the way up into Washington and up towards Puget Sound. And then you know, those black dots that you can see further north in this map are uh, objects that are found in Vancouver Island and then in British Columbia. So Newberry Crater gets carried quite away from the original source through trading. Other things that we we're finding are animal bones, both natural and cultural. And this is just a, a representative sample of one level of excavation inside the caves. Many of these are natural bones, but there's also bones from uh, people cooking and processing animals inside the caves. There's quite a mix of both in there. Uh, most of the animals we are finding at the caves still live in Oregon or in the vicinity. And so um, nothing exceptional, but with some information about subsistence uh, it adds to the record for sure. And then the primary object that we're finding in Redmond Caves is chipping debris from the stone tools. So sometimes thousands of pieces of this came from an excavation unit and um, uh, tells us about general occupations in various levels in the caves when it's in a protected and intact setting. Um, this stuff is all churned up, so it's hard to do much with it except uh, preserve it for future research. And then this is the um, antler digging stick handle that came out. And this is when it was recorded in situ or in place during excavation on the last day. And there it is again. So the analyses that we did included obsidian sourcing and hydration, radiocarbon dating, 
animal bone analysis. We did an analysis of the plant remains that were coming from the site too. And then the debitage or uh, flaking debris analysis as well. So who is here? If we look at things from the ethnographic record, from the historical record of anthropologists studying in, uh, different tribal groups, we can say with some consistency that men's and women's tools are represented. Digging stick handles and ground stone for processing seeds, uh, perching trays, burden basket fragments, uh, are associated with women's activities ethnographically. That doesn't mean exclusively, but it is common. And then manufacturing of stone tools is associated most commonly with men's activities. Uh, there are always exceptions to those rules. Uh, Great Basin and Plateau artifacts. So we're seeing different kinds of stone tools that are diagnostic for Great Basin or desert country to the south and east. Uh, other types of di diagnostic stone tools are from plateau settings. And then that one artifact, that one point found in Cave 4 is Paleo-Indian, which is a widespread phenomenon that occurred uh, throughout uh, the western part of the United States. And then we also have trade items, marine shell beads, steatite or soapstone as it's called, and obsidian are all things that were traded or transported from long distances. So uh, the information that came out of the case is really interesting. Uh, and uh, there's just so much more work that can be done there. This is always the case with archeological uh, work. Good projects lead to more questions and we have a lot more questions about Redmond Caves after the short period of time that we worked there. So that's all I have. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. It's kind of a whirlwind presentation. Um, and thank you for listening. Yeah, so Pat, can you stop sharing your screen? I've got a couple of questions for you. Stop, stop share. OK. Yes. OK. Uh, so. Sarah wants to know, are there any current plans to excavate Cave 2? Cave 2, no. And I, I would really hope that Cave 2 gets left alone for a long time. Um, the, the thing about having an intact cave in a setting like that is that, you know, I've been doing archaeology for 25 years now, something like that. And I've seen technological advances that are just tremendous in that period of time. Uh, I think that we're doing more right now with a cubic foot of dirt than people were doing with entire sites 25, 50 years ago. You know, further back in time, the less technology that we could bring out of site. So if we save Cave 2, leave it buried. Um, for future researchers or, or just it's just nice to know that it's there. So one way or the other, it, it could be approached, but but it's nothing that I intend to do. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so Charles asks, I'm or makes a statement. I'm used to hearing the carbon date of an ob, of an object's origin. How would you differentiate the age of an improved object, like a sandal or a tool? How, how would you, uh, I'm sorry, I missed the last part of that. Yeah, how would you differentiate the age of an improved object, like a sandal or a tool? Um, this is about carbon dating, I think. Yeah, so in terms of radiocarbon dating, uh, what we try and do is, you don't radiocarbon date a site you radiocarbon date an object from the site. So you try and pick the best thing that's most likely to give you a date on the site. And in this case, we had that sagebrush bark sandal um, that we could date using radiocarbon methods. Um, if we were trying to date a stone tool, like a obsidian uh, projectile point, we would date that using obsidian hydration. So we'd take a cut a wedge out of the, the, out of the obsidian object, 
And then look at how much moisture had been absorbed uh, into the object since the time it was flaked. And that's a that's a pretty cool thing that you can do. It's it's something that tells us a lot about relative use of a site. Uh, I'm not sure I'm answering the question that you're posing. Yeah. I, and, and I'm not sure if I if I read it correctly. I'm not an archaeologist, so I'm just reading the questions that comes in through the chat or the Q and A. Um, so, Charles, let us know if you if you got the answer you needed. Um, so, Derek wants to know what was the most interesting discovery you have you had made. Uh, personally. Um... I'm working at a site right now uh, down by Riley, and uh, I found a orange agate stone tool that is buried underneath camel tooth enamel, um, and under uh, volcanic ash from the eruption of Mount St. Helens. You know, yesterday was the 41st anniversary of the eruption of Mount St. I, re I remember that day so well. <laughs> oh, me too. Me too. It was a spectacular day. Yes. But but the St. Helens we're looking at dates to an earlier eruption that was 15,400 years ago. So we're looking at a stone tool that's buried underneath that. And to me, that's super interesting because what I'm trying to do now with that site is trying to figure out if that artifact belongs underneath that volcanic ash. And if not, how did it get there? So that's super intriguing. The fact that it could be that old is interesting. Um, the fact that I have that puzzle to solve is even better. Oh, I love, I love puzzles. I love solving puzzles. Um, so this also comes in from Dennis. Um, and I'm going to say this wrong. I do not have any idea what this is. Have any coprolites been found? <clears throat> any coprolites. Did um, I say that right? Yes. Yeah, you did. Oh, okay. <laughs> Makes me wonder if Dennis Jenkins asked that question. <laughs> Dennis Hansen. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we have not found copper lights in Redmond Caves. And I think part of the reason is that in copper lights are, are dried human, well, they're dried fecal material. And when we find human feces that are dried in, in protected caves, it's just a wealth of information. All kinds of stuff can be derived and they can be radiocarbon dated. Um, but in Redmond Caves, we have seasonal uh, precipitation. So snow comes in and, it's, and it leaches into the cave, uh, floor deposits and rain does also. These are not dry protected caves. Uh, so coprolites don't preserve, or at least not in the places where we've excavated. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna give a couple of extra, anybody else have a, a question or? Chat, this has been super informative and, and Pat, you and I were visiting before this uh, webinar started. And, you know, I, I grew up in Central Oregon. I, I've lived in Redmond since 1999 and I have never been to the caves. You know, if I'm passing through there on my way towards other places to the east, I am going to find you and take you out there. So. <laughs> I would love that because I feel like I would get a super in-depth uh, Tour of the caves. I would love that. I would invite you to do that. Um, okay, so this question is from Sarah. Is there a reason to use BP instead of BCE? Um, it's just in general easier. You know, there are applications for using uh, BCE or uh, AD. And most of the time that's in sites that are more recent. So from the past couple of thousand years and more common in the Southwest and certain other parts of the US. Uh, in Oregon sites, we have used BP just because it's direct. When you say something is, is 2000 years before present, then it's 2000 years before present. If you say something is 200 BCE, that roughly translates to 2,200 years or 2,200 years. 
So it just works better for talking directly about dates. And we do a lot of radiocarbon dating here. So uh, it shorthands it in a way. Thank you. Uh, so Deborah wants to know, are there any petroglyphs in the caves? That would be a hard question to address because the caves have been so heavily vandalized. Um, one of the challenges I found when I was taking pictures of the students working inside the caves is I had to make sure that I oriented my photographs so that I didn't catch the obscene uh, words that were spray painted on various sides of the caves. And there's a whole um, kind of a cottage industry associated with taking uh, people who have a reason to repay the system and, and having them scrub the graffiti off the insides of the caves and out, off the outside. So any petroglyphs that might have been there have probably been spray painted over at some time and then wire brushed into oblivion. So I have yeah. not seen anything. Uh, so, um, Sarah, uh, let, let's see, let's, let's call this the last question. Okay. So Sarah would also like to know, are any of the artifacts from the caves on display? Um, they are not on display. They're still, um, they have been at the University of Oregon at times past, especially the elk antler digging stick handle but um, they're available for, for examination, but they're not on display. You know, then that's one of the things that I, uh, if I could have just a couple more minutes to talk. Yeah, to. go for it. Yes, totally. One of the things that, that a place like the University of Oregon Museum of Natural and Cultural History does is it preserves objects from various various circumstances from the history and the prehistory of Oregon. And there are so many things in our collections that don't go on display because we have such limited space for display. But that doesn't mean that people aren't seeing them and they're not using them. We have uh, people constantly coming to the curation facility to view objects and to do research on different uh, artifacts and other objects. The, if you would go to the Museum of Natural and Cultural History uh, webpage, you can see that there's an entire uh, digital record of the basketry that's held in the museum collections. And there's other digital collections that are coming online uh, as more of them are photographed and recorded for that purpose. So we can't show everything in the displays in the exhibit halls, but we're trying really hard to get things uh, up and on display digitally. So in some ways you can see through the spectacular arrays of objects from the heritage of Oregon uh, sitting in, in your living room on your computer. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, I look forward to uh, you coming through Redmond and taking me on a guided tour <laughs> of the Redmond Caves. Um, and I really want to acknowledge uh, the work of the Historic Preservation Committee and um, really appreciate the work that they're doing. Um, so any anything else before we sign off tonight? From me? Yeah, anything? Oh, oh. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, you totally. know, it's, it's really great to have the opportunity about this site. I loved it dearly. I miss working there and I stopped there pretty often whenever I come through town because it is a it is a very special place and if none of you or some of you have not been out <clears throat> no names will be mentioned um, yeah <laughs> you yeah. really you really should go because it's a it's a 40 acre park that's a natural park in the middle of Redmond and it's just it, it's 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 a pleasure to be there so. yeah um, so thank you, Pat. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, this video will be available on our YouTube channel in a matter of days. So thanks for uh, tuning in. All right. Thank you. Thank you. See you all.